happy to introduce Mark. How do you say it? Nic Nikolic. Nikolic. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to say it wrong. So oh, I good. <laughs> um, Mark is a PhD student at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. He's from Melbourne, Australia. He loves trilobites, computational net methods, and disco music. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's currently working on using different computational methods to resolve long standing questions of trilobite evolutionary relationships and the timing of their evolution, as well as how they grew from babies to adults. So very excited to hear, hear what you have to say. Um, in addition to that, I want to invite everyone to visit the Geology Museum at some point today or in the near future. Uh, we have unveiled a new trilobite exhibit at the museum. Um, so this exhibit is unique because it incorporates some of the history of the museum. And one curator in particular, who was actually credited with being the first person to find fossilized evidence of appendages on trilobites. So there were some cool things that we pulled out of the archives and the historic collections to make that exhibit. So please check it out. So thank you. Without further ado, Mark, please take it away. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll just take a moment to get this on. Okay, great. How does that sound? Good? Okay. Louder? Louder. Let's get this closer. Okay, how about that? Good? Okay, also project my voice a little more too. Um, okay, well, thanks for coming out everyone. Um, it's really cool to be here. Thanks for uh, the invite um, to come out and talk. I really appreciate that um, and I'm excited to get to talk about um, one of my true loves, the trilobites, and the work that I get to do on them. Um, yeah, so I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History uh, in New York. I'm in my final year, and I want to talk today about uh, a bit of what I've been doing, or just a bit about trilobites generally, and a bit of what about, a bit of, a bit of about what I've been doing during my PhD, tongue twister. Cool. <clears throat> so trilobites, let's just start here. What are they or what were they? Now, when we think of trilobites, you know, when I tell people I work on trilobites, um, the first things that come to mind, they're like, oh, like horseshoe crabs or like roly polies, pill bugs, slaters, whatever you call them. Um, and I'm like, okay, close but not quite. Because while these are all arthropods, meaning they all have an exoskeleton. They all have jointed appendages, like legs, antennae, etc. And why they are all segmented, uh, and you can see um, particularly uh, the dorsal expression of the segmentation in both the um, slater or the pill bug and the trilobite. Um, it helps if we think about the arthropod tree of life to think about what trilobites actually are, or what they were. Um, or a phylogeny, or the uh, arthropod phylogeny, if you will. So now if we put on where each of these groups sit, and we see some that we've already seen before, we can see uh, the crustaceans, um, including the, the pill bugs, um, and the chalicerata, which includes the horseshoe crabs, and the things like scorpions and spiders and everything, they sit on their own uh, lineages within the arthropod tree of life, uh, their own branches, and we also have the, you know, the hexapods, the insects, and the, the myriapods, the centipedes, and uh, millipedes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what, what the important thing here to see is like trilobites are sitting on their own branch in the arthropod tree of life. They are their own group of animals, separate from all of these other arthropods. But sadly, they are all entirely extinct. So trilobites are the only completely extinct major group of arthropods, which is really sad. Uh, so importantly, there are no living descendants of trilobites. Now some other, you know, fun facts, important, very important fun facts about trilobites is that they were exclusively marine. So all of the fossils that have ever been found of trilobites are all from uh, marine sediments, mar uh, what were marine deposits. And another really important thing is that they had 
a biomineralized exoskeleton. Uh, so they incorporated uh, calcite from the oceans into their exoskeleton uh, to create this hard shell. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we have a really good fossil record of trilobites is because they, have, uh, they had this really hard biomineralized exoskeleton, which created uh, a lot of a high preservation potential because those exoskeletons wouldn't break down so easily. So they were similar to how um, vertebrate bones are uh, mineralized and hardened with calcium. Now, when we think about the trilobite body plan, we can break it down a little bit into some important regions. So we have the cephalon, or the head region, uh, which consists of fused segments. So we, even though there's uh, parts of the, or segments that make up the head, we can't see the expression of those segments because they're fused. But in the thorax, the middle part, we have articulating segments. So we can see each of these little building blocks that build up the thorax, each of these segments, and these would articulate, meaning they could flex between each other. And this cre created the ability to have this kind of like undulating flexion in the trilobite body. And in the pygidium, or the tail region of the trilobite, this consisted of segments that weren't necessarily fused, but they wouldn't articulate, or the exoskeleton wouldn't articulate so the tail was, was rigid as a fixed structure. And then we can break it down by uh, along the longitudinal um, anterior posterior axis and we have this middle region or this middle lobe called the axial lobe that runs uh, down this, the center of the body of the animal. And either side of that are two pleural lobes. Now if we have three lobes, we have a three-lobed thing, or a trilobite, and that's where they get their name. Now, in addition to this very basic looking trilobite, this is probably one, if you know anything about trilobites, you would have seen this one before a million times. This is called Elrathia kingi. It's, I think there are literally estimated to be some millions of specimens of this around the world. It's very common. But we have lots of different uh, diversity of morphologies within trilobites, right? And this is what makes them so fantastic as well. This one has a hexagon for a head. Lots of spines. This is one of my favorites. It's really cute one at the bottom here. It's super cute. Eyes on stalks, fantastic. This one's wearing a funny hat. Uh, these ones are doing a little like conga line dance. But this actually also might shock you all, is there are over 22,000 described species of trilobites. So this incredible amount of diversity in this group of fossil-only organisms. Now, if we think about the size of trilobites as well, and we try to put some more context around the group in terms of their morphology and the scale of them. So these are some of the biggest known trilobites around, uh, and the, the, the scale here is in millimeters in the x-axis. So the largest trilobite specimen ever known is about 720 millimeters which is about the size of a big umbrella, you know, so let's say about this big. Oh, yeah, about that. And this is the smallest, or one of the smallest known trilobites. And let's actually put it into scale next to the rest of these. So if we scaled this one down, <laughs> there we go. Can we still see it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, it's there, it's a tiny little dot. It's probably w about one pixel now compared to the rest. So the size range in this group is also just truly fantastic. And now here we're also showing, um, this is from the paleobiology database, um, all of the, the, the occurrences that have been put into this database of trilobites from around the world. So each of these little dots represents an occurrence of trilobites um, and where they've been found um, on today's um, continental setup. And you can see that there's, you know, a pretty much nearly global distribution of these animals too. So we don't want to, we don't want to look at this right now. Not the, the, <laughs> the chronostrat chart. So let's make this a little more simplified. Okay, this is better. Um, you know, so let's break it down to the major eras here: Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. So the trilobites first appear around 521 million years ago in like, you know, around the end of the early Cambrian. Um, 
and they existed until the end Permian mass extinction. So they had a pretty long and big run. And put, put this into more context again, the dinosaurs, they don't, you know, they don't appear until sometime around 240 million years ago. And you know, we all know how they ended too. Well, actually, yeah, they still, I guess, are around sometimes. Um, and then, yeah, there's us there. So the trilobites were such an early group of complex animals that had such a long run. And to me, this is so fantastic to why I like to study them. And here's a, another famous plot um, from uh, Sepkoski. This is the, the famous Sepkoski curve um, showing the number of families over, um, or number of animal, marine animal families over geologic uh, time, known families, and uh, the cumulative records of those. And uh, Sepkoski described these three evolutionary or great evolutionary faunas. Um, these groups of animals that make up um, the, the majority of um, the faunas at given uh, intervals of time evolution in evolutionary scales. And the Cambrian fauna, which is uh, highlighted here, so the first major evolutionary group of animals, and this is dominated by trilobites. So really the point here is that trilobites are one of the first, or really the first group of globally dominant complex animals on Earth. So now we want to get into uh, something that's like that I do that I'm working on is is growth and development in trilobites. So what I've showed you uh, so far now have been adult trilobites um, specimens, and the one on the right is an adult. But we know that things don't just get born as adults or animals usually. Um, so how does it get from a baby, which is actually what's depicted here on the left? to an adult. And if you can see, put the, uh, have the scale bar here too, to show you the baby is about one millimeter in length. And uh, the adult there is, you know, several millimeters wide and, you know, um, about a dozen millimeters long. So how, how does it grow this, this much? And what you'll also notice here actually, well, I hope is that there are a lot more segments in the trilobite on the right than there are on the trilobite on the left. So one of the things that poses a challenge for arthropod growth is the fact that they have an exoskeleton. So if you have a hard outer shell and you want to get bigger, that shell will stop you from getting bigger because it can't also grow with you because it's hard and rigid. So trilobites, uh, would molt like all arthropods do to shed their hard exoskeleton and let their soft body parts grow, then re-mineralize their exoskeleton to get hard again. And uh, trilobites also are one of the earliest groups to display these complex molting strategies and morphologies and behaviors around molting. So what this, uh, oh, before, before I get this arrow, this photo is also really cool, just a side note, because if you see at the top of the trilobite head, it looks like it's poking its tongue out. Um, and what that actually is, is the mouth plate that sits underneath on the underside that's been flipped out after it died uh, and it got preserved that way. Um, just a just cool little specimen. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to point out here was this arrow points to what are called the sutures or the cephalic sutures, the sutures that run through the head. And there's uh, one on either side and hopefully you can see the one on the other side. And then I'll highlight it here in pink. And these sutures were points uh, that would allow the exoskeleton, they were weaker points that would allow the exoskeleton to break and then let the trilobite um, split open its exoskeleton and crawl out. Uh, in order to get out of the, the, the hard skeleton and grow. So here's a photo now where they've, this trilobite has actually has shed its uh, um, free cheeks, they're called, the cheeks, and um, it has died shortly after it split its, its cheeks open and then been preserved. And you can see that there, and there's the suture line that matches up 
with the suture line in the other photo. So they would break open these cheeks, break open the head then, crawl out, and that's how they would, they would grow. Now, before we get into this kind of like co mildly complex looking figure, what I wanted to say is that trilobites, when they did this process as juveniles, would also add a new segment to their body. So they start with, on the left side, let's go through. They start with no body segments, and every time they molt, they would add a new body segment to their body until they grow to be an adult, and then they have all of their body segments. And so just what I want to walk through this image or this diagram here is one of the ways that we know how this happens is because if you imagine starting from this, uh, this hypothetical specimen here, second from the left, we have a new segment and a spine on that segment being developed three from the head. So the segments would develop at the very tail of, or the very end of the tail of the trilobite and then it would molt and it would go to the next one and it would add a new segment at the very back again. And this would essentially push all the other segments forward, right? So now we can see that that spine denoted by the yellow triangle is now one segment forward. And if we follow this along, every time a new segment would get added, uh, the animal would molt, add a new segment in the tail, that spine looks like it's moving more towards the head, but it's really just because the tail is getting bigger. And so we see, we find beds of specimens that have all the other same distinguishing morphological features. They just have, uh, that denote that species, um, they just have different numbers of segments. And so this shows us uh, that we can um, reconstruct the growth series of those animals. And so here is what one growth series of this taxon, Elrathia kingi, would look like. Um, so we have a baby here that has zero body segments, thoracic segments. It has the pygidium, or the tail, but no thoracic segments. And we're just going to skip a couple because they're hard to see the segments in those small ones. So we get to number, this one has four, five, six, so on and so on, until it has 13 segments, and then it's an adult. And actually they would keep growing and molting once they got to be an adult, they just wouldn't add any more segments. So when we have these reconstructed growth series, and we have these for a number of taxa, uh, we can begin to understand, start analyzing uh, these growth patterns and understand how these growth patterns and way that they grew might have affected their evolution and ways of life. And here's another kind of complicated figure, but I'm going to break this down as to what this means, and this kind of summarizes a lot of my study in this one kind of figure. So if we have this growth series of trilobites again, now we can think about this, if, if some, a group of animals, broader group of animals, has similar genetic information, right? So they're, they're related and they or they might not even be uh, closely related, but they have some underlying similar genetic information that might encode for the way that they build segments, for example. Um, the way that they actually grow from babies to adults, so that growth and development can produce differences, measurable differences in their phenotypes or in those traits that we can measure. So if we think about trilobites then, we can imagine that they have all these features and we know that like certain from uh, experiments on modern animals that they develop in a certain way um, or that they have certain sets of genes that have been conserved over really long periods of evolutionary time, we can then look at how these growth patterns in trilobites will affect the adult morphologies in different groups of trilobites. And to highlight this, I want to take an example from mice, actually. And so bear with me as I kind of walk through, walk through this example. So in mice, this uh, in this experiment, they were looking at how the molars of mice grew. And the molars of mice actually grow very similar 
to how segments in other animals grow. So the first molar will kind of start to develop in, or the molar tooth, that is, will start to develop in the, the gum of the embryo. And as that starts to form the tooth, a, another, the second tooth in that row, buds off the first one. And then the third one buds off the second one. And it's this kind of cascading segmentation um, style of growth that's actually very similar um, to how arthropods and other things that have segments um, grow their segments. And what the authors of this experiment in this study found was that this way of developing actually produces very uh, simple but a very strong bias in the actual um, uh, sizes and shapes of the structures that they produce. And what they see here is that if we think about three molars, M1, M2, M3, three teeth in a row, it produces this pattern of uh, a um, similar change in size from one tooth to the next. So as that first, um, sorry, as that second tooth develops off the the first one and the third off the second, there's something that happens between them that makes them be um, a constant ratio along that, that row. So and if you plot out the size difference of these structures, you just get a linear line, no matter if it's going down in slope, up in slope, or staying the same. And the authors term this model the inhibitory cascade model. Now, Further extensions um, of looking at this model have found it to be very common actually in different structures and in different uh, groups of vertebrates. So the limbs, so the, you know, the upper arm, the forearm and the hand, um, the vertebrae, um, the phalanges of fingers, and these all include things for us as well. Um, they all follow this simple pattern of a constant ratio of size between the segments. So, investigate with this in mind, thinking about this in this context, uh, in a study um, that we published last year, we showed that trilobites also display this pattern very strongly too. So in the tail region, in the pygidium, where new segments are growing, they are actually under this same bias to produce uh, a structure that has a constant ratio of size change between those segments. And here's just a few examples. Let's don't worry about the, the plot on the top right for now, but a few examples here showing uh, a few different trilobites and how those, when we plot out the sizes of those, they follow this linear pattern very strongly. Uh, and this plot on the top right is just showing that uh, the vast majority of our uh, of our sampled of over 100 specimens, uh, sorry, 100 different species, has, uh, they have these very high R squared values, and the R squared value is the measure of uh, the linearity. So, trilobites and vertebrates appear to have this, this similar uh, developmental, this, the way that they're growing is producing this bias in their body shapes, in their body um, features, which is really cool. And while the underlying genetic mechanisms, we can't determine whether they're the same, but there is something producing uh, these strong biases in both of these groups. Now, to think about uh, in what I've been doing lately is thinking about how this bias might affect the, whole trial, the evolution of the whole trilobite body. And because we, we can see that there are, in this case on the top, a situation where the whole body looks like it has this kind of like cascading um, uh, um, continuous uh, ratio, or sorry, same ratio of continuous change throughout the body that produces this kind of like funnel shape in the body. But we also do see trilobites where they have this more rounded body shape like this on the bottom. And what we, we already know about trilobites as well from studying their growth is that the uh, segments in their thorax, the articulating ones, uh, can have different growth rates. So they can grow at different rates relative to one another each time that they molt. 
And what this means is like in the case of the green one at the bottom here, is that some segments might grow faster than others, and therefore uh, they will get bigger than they otherwise would have under this inhibitory cascade model. And they can produce different shapes, like these rounder body shapes, for example. But the important thing uh, to note is still that the uh, pygidium here in the bottom one, it seems to still follow this, this linear rule. Oops. So when we put this into more, uh, when we follow this, this story along a little bit more, we have this idea of these, uh, going back to this figure, these developmental interactions producing uh, these different uh, phenotypes or these different morphologies, these different observable, measurable traits. But without uh, a family tree, without uh, phylogeny or understanding the evolutionary relationships between the trilobites that we're looking at, we lose a lot of information or we lose a lot of our ability to understand the timing of these evolutionary events in which groups um, these developmental um, processes might have been influencing them. Uh, we lose the ability to um, kind of put these into the context of environmental changes, uh, mass extinction events, and so on and so forth. So when we have a tree as well, a phylogeny, we get a lot more ability to answer these questions and relate them to bigger picture ideas. The problem with a lot of trilobite groups is that we don't have these phylogenies or reconstructed uh, trees of life for a lot of trilobite groups. And this is a figure pulled from uh, Richard Forty in 2001. And this show, summarizes this problem uh, quite well. Uh, don't focus on the details. The important thing here is that there are just a lot of question marks spread throughout this tree. This is the best understanding that we had in 2001. And honestly, this is still the best understanding, well, that we have today, mostly. Uh, I'm working on it. Um, but these question marks are everywhere. So this is what I've been doing, is, is working on one of these bigger groups of trilobites at the order level and trying to resolve these relationships in order to put uh, context to evolutionary context to some of these uh, traits and um, uh, growth patterns that we see. And so to do that, uh, I wanted to talk about the process of, of building a tree of life for these, these animals, for example. And we start with building uh, what's called a character matrix and um, essentially what that is, is you take all of the taxa of interest, interest, the species of interest. So in this case, we have species ABC, for example. Let's imagine here we have uh, species A, um, Dimera pygi sperai. Um, we have a nice little reconstruction here and then these uh, very nice SEM images of this solicified material. And we would say for a character one or for trait one, let's say, does it have little bumps on its head, right? And so this trilobite, we see it has these little bumps on its head. So we can say, okay, it has bumps on its head. We can count that as a one. We would say uh, no would be zero or yes would be one. And we count this as one. And then for character two, we can say, are those traits, or sorry, are those bumps uh, arranged in rows or are they random? If they're in rows, they will be zero. If they're random, they'll be one. And so in this case, it's they're random. So we, we put it in as, oh, the other way around. But yeah, you get me. Uh, and we do this for all of the characteristics that we, that we want to observe. Um, and we do this for all the species and we build this matrix. And so uh, in this case, I've just got uh, this, this plate up here to kind of, um, uh, to come back to thinking about the morphologies that we have to think about or the traits that we have to think about in trilobites, we have a lot of different characteristics that we can actually observe because the, uh, the exoskeletons would be preserved in such fine detail for a lot of these that we can actually construct a lot of uh, really good um, characters and build these really large um, data-rich uh, character matrices for these groups. Now, this uh, building, constructing 
characters uh, for any group is difficult, and they just for constructing characters for these trilobites. So thinking about what is a trait on one animal that might be different from another. You think about we need to think about these characteristics that will differentiate, you know, species between one another, groups from between one another, and we need to do this in a way you're thinking about that we're going to be using these kind of complex uh, mathematical algorithms to pass out like what is what, like to, to actually um, to determine those differences. And so here is just kind of like an example of like here where me and my advisor um, had been thinking about how we can code or construct a character that will represent these different um, tails with the spines on them um, and then also incorporate all of the other possibilities of tails, trilobite tails with spines on them. And then we've just like sketched out everything here. And we've done this for over 350 different characters. Uh, and here's another example of uh, just one of, just another challenge that we face um, in kind of like, just another example of a, yeah, of a challenge. So this trilobite on the left, um, it has, the, the, the back of the head, um, so the very, the bottom of the top part, um, is kind of just smooth and rounded. But you can see in the, the plate in the middle that it has this big spine that comes off the back of the head. Um, but it's smooth and then it comes into a pointy spine. Uh, but then on the uh, plate with the specimens on the right, uh, you can see that both of these have uh, this kind of, sp it's really, this is also like some of the problems is that some of this material is also very like scrappy, um, but such is life. And what this is showing is that there's a, a spine that comes off the back, but it like is very wide. Now the question here is that, is that actually a spine or is it just that part of the head being extended back? And we debated this for a long time because they, these are two different characters. These would, these would be two different characters. And in the end, we determined that it was a spine, but it highlights the challenge of like really think when you get to this, these details, when you get right into the weeds of thinking about these animals, like these, these questions keep you up at night. But it's all worth it when you get a nice tree. <laughs> Um, and you get to put it on a geologic time scale and you get to be like, here's the relationships that, here's our best guess of the evolutionary relationships of this group that lived 500 million years ago. And that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so this is actually not, this is a preliminary tree. Um, so we're still doing work on this, uh, running some more analyses and, and things, but here's a, it's still pretty good. Um, oh yeah. So then, once we have this tree, now, I've been using this technique called geometric morphometrics um, to understand the shape of the body. And so what I'm trying to link back to here is thinking about how the shape of the body is influenced by the development of the segments, the growth of the segments, and the shape of the body over the trilobite tree of life might have changed at different points but now we need to understand how the shape of the body looks in all of those trilobites. And this is where we use this technique called geometric morphometrics. And really, it sounds fancy, but all you're doing is just putting little points on a photo, and then, you, then that creates, uh, then there's a bunch of math involved, but essentially, when you do this for a lot of specimens, then you get, this is a very rushed looking figure, I'm sorry, but, um, you get like what looks, this is showing the diversity of all of the trilobite body shapes for all of the species that I have in my um, phylogenetic tree in that group of trilobites. And so we actually get to quantify now the shape of the body of the trilobite in all these groups. And what's one thing that's just really interesting is that uh, this, the black, the, the dark black uh, circles, uh, they represent um, the mean or the average trilobite shape for all of these groups. And the average trilobite is so average looking. Like it's, 
it's truly actually quite fantastic. Um, right, so now this is where I'm at. I have all of this data. Now I have to put it, now I'm putting it all together. Um, and so now we, again, use a bunch of models uh, to plot how those body shapes have changed throughout the evolutionary history of this group. And then, you know, this group has existed over, we can see here that they've uh, gone through the end Ordovician mass extinctions, the Devonian extinction events. Um, they've gone through uh, changes in sea chemistry. So once we have uh, the information about how, or the models that will tell us about how these body shapes have changed over time, uh, we can correlate those with these environmental um, factors as well and begin to understand how the growth of trilobites played into their ability to respond to environmental changes and what might have uh, restricted their ability to evolve new body shapes, for example. And finally, I just wanted to end on uh, some field work I've been doing, collecting some new developmental material um, from um, some species that we don't have uh, fully described um, uh, growth series is for. So uh, I've been doing a lot of field work out in Utah, uh, which is pretty fantastic. Um, here's a photo of us, me, my advisor, uh, Melanie Hopkins, um, curator of invertebrate paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, Anna Rushkova, who's our uh, fantastic fossil preparator. Uh, Jake Spicer, who's a, um, an absolute hoot to be out in the field with, fantastic volunteer. There's me on the far right, much more bearded, um, but it's a great spot. Uh, and so here we've got some drone footage of what the, some of the sites are actually like. So is that gonna play? Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so here we're out in, or, well, it's a little laggy, but you get the idea. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, this is Middle Cambrian. Um, these are all shales. It's really beautiful out there. I love being out there. We're pretty tiny there. You can see us. Is this in national parks? Sorry? Is it in national parks? No, no, it's in... Uh, the West Desert area, yeah. Okay. And here's another one. Wonder if there'll be, this is from a different, around the same region, but a different locality. I think it's just slightly younger, younger in age. But this one's also like, just really good for showing you the scale that we're finding trilobites that, you know, are maybe uh, half an inch big in this landscape and to me that like blows my mind every time I'm out there like these 505 million year old trilobites that lived under the ocean that long and we're just finding them out there it's it's part of why I love my job <laughs> Yeah, so that's that. So thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Great. Okay, questions? Yes, okay. Uh, two questions. Sure. Uh, first of all, do all trilobites have 13 segments? No, this number varies quite a lot um, between groups, particularly um, in the early... Uh, groups, so the Cambrian trilobites, there's massive variation. Um, some groups, I think the lowest number is three, and it goes up to something like 111 or 100 and something, I think is the most, yeah. So, yeah, but uh, through, as you get um, younger and younger through geologic time, uh, that number decreases quite a lot, like the average number decreases, and then it gets to something like eight, becomes the average in the Devonian, I think, yeah. All the images we see, we see the length and the width, but nothing about the thickness. Is there a ratio, general ratio, between the 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we we don't know because all of the trilobites that are preserved in like shales, for example, they're all flattened, and we have no un, no idea of their actual the three dimensionality to them. I mean, we have a rough idea of what that might have been, um, but yeah, oftentimes, I mean, you can get three dimensional trilobites for sure, absolutely, um, but the vast majority of them that we get where we're doing these measurements, we're taking them in two dimensions because it's a lot easier, um, but we don't have an actual understanding of the ratio of the, like, the actual volume of what a trilobite, the average volume of a trilobite, for example, yeah. But it would be really cool, yeah. I, I was wondering if you have been able to, uh, as you work through the long evolutionary changes, have been able to find any uh, an, an evolution of various capabilities, like an organ that could uh, discern shape from the light from the dark or, or, or anything like that. Yeah, one of the big, um, one of the big kind of avenues of research in trilobites right now is uh, understanding this behavior called enrollment. So you might have seen a trilobite that's rolled up in a ball, much like pill bugs, roly polies do. So trilobites uh, have been preserved, uh, many different groups of trilobites are preserved in this ball shape. Um, so we know that they could do this behavior and actually they have structures that they've evolved, particularly uh, later in their evolutionary history that allow them to, for example, lock, like actually lock the tail into the head to, to exactly, to lock it in and stop them from being pulled apart again. And so we think that the, uh, the, the, what, the body shape, for example, is also going to have a big impact on their ability to roll up and to keep all of their soft parts protected. So the underside is, is actually mostly soft. It's not biomineralized. So the legs are not biomineralized like the exoskeleton is, the digestive tract and everything. So yeah, we think that that is a, um, a big important kind of trait. Yeah. How come uh, they were so diverse, you say, and so big, and how come it, you have any idea why they were not uh, having any descendants, like with such diversity? It's a big question, yeah. Uh, so they were already on the decline after, particularly after the Devonian extinctions. So they were already on the decline and then uh, when the end Permian hit, they went totally extinct. Um, and we don't really have any real, like absolute reasons why. Um, people have hypothesized that the rise of fishes for example, so you think about trilobites evolved when fishes were kind of these, these tiny little like nothing things that just kind of hung out and the trilobites took over the oceans. But then when things like placoderms, the, the big fish with, you know, the armored heads and big jaws, um, well, they didn't have jaws, proper jaws yet, right? Is that true? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My invertebrate paleo is showing. Um, but... Um, yeah, when these, these uh, bigger animals, um, vertebrate animals, kind of start to take over the oceans as well, they kind of filled a lot of these niches and also preyed upon the trilobites as well. And also with the changing sea chemistries, everything that the Earth was um, still, you know, like there was a lot of turbulence going on still. Um, uh, so they, you know, had been through lots of different things. It's actually kind of amazing that they actually lived that long. Um, yeah, but there's no... We don't have definitive evidence for anything. We don't have a um, crater, you know, a meteor impact crater. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So earlier in the presentation, you showed a map of the world where the trial bites have been found. Mm -hmm. Why was Africa pretty much empty? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, I think that's probably part of um, sampling bias. Um, and I'm actually also not too familiar with what the geology of like Central Africa is. So I'm not sure if there are actually, if there's like Paleozoic um, outcrops that have been 
like accessed or reported on um, in those areas. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so the things like the Hox genes, if you've heard of those, um, they're something that are very evolutionary cons evolutionarily conserved. So they're actually, these sets of genes are found in um, a vast array, nearly, I think nearly all animal groups. And these control like the planning of, or the body plan. So the formation of, um, you know, the head to tail axis. So what, what will be the head, what will be the tail and, you know, and things like that. They also control segmentation um, to some extent in some groups. So things like that um, are homologous, um, but the actual, uh, like the mechanisms, like there's something that's called like a clock and wave front type of mechanism, which is a, um, a gene regulated um, system of <coughs> uh, controlling what, um, what molecules are produced that will tell a certain region to become a segment in, in the animal. And these things vary uh, a little differently in vertebrates and um, arthropods, but we know that there are certainly some homologous um, genes that control segmentation in both groups. Yeah. How much do you know about the internal anatomy of these animals? Uh, we've been learning a lot more recently actually with, um, with new specimens, with exceptional preservation being found and with new imaging techniques. We actually have um, begun to develop quite a pretty good understanding of things like the digestive system for example. So we have, uh, we've seen actually like we, or we have images of trilobites where you can see the whole digestive tract, for example. And the digestive tract actually, so I talked about the mouth plate, which is called the hypostome. And that sits like under the, the head. So the trilobite's like this and its head's pointing that way. And, sorry, oh, there we go. There we go, I'll come out here. It's like. Imagine this is the trilobite head, like on, the, on the, the ocean floor, and the mouth plate sits like under like this, so it's hooked around. And so they would scrape up food like this and bring it in. Does that make sense? So it's coming like that. So the digestive tract goes like that, um, which is pretty cool, yeah. Um, and we've also, we have uh, exceptional preservation of the limbs as well, uh, which also preserve the gills. So there's been some CT scanning of these pyritized, um, so where the legs have been preserved with pyrite actually, and the gill structures have been CT scanned and the microstructure of those gills has been documented and we can actually see how trilobites would have breathed underwater as well. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. What would they eat? You don't know anything about the, the brain specifically. Yeah. What would they eat? Oh, uh, we don't know exactly what they ate, but they were probably scavengers mostly, eating detritus off the seafloor. Um, but some have been hypothesized to be predatory. So um, they would have, so horseshoe crabs, for example, have their limbs or their legs. Some of them have these uh, structures on them that they use to essentially like crush prey like this. And tri some trilobites have these similar kind of structures as well. So we infer that, that to be um, indicative of them performing this similar behavior and also preying upon um, shell, small shelly things as well. So it's likely they were filling all niches within, um, or the all available niches of eating smaller invertebrates, um, also scavengers, some are also probably eating algae, uh, things like that, yeah. Fossils that exist that uh, of, of larger fisher animals that where they were consumed. Or? That's a good question. I don't actually know if there's any like 
gut contents are like coprolites, which is like fossilized poo that's been preserved that has trilobite bits in it. Did they lay eggs? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we had presumed that because like all arthropods, um, I'm pretty sure, lay eggs or have eggs. And uh, there have been some trilobites that have been found um, also preserved with pyrite where they have these, what we infer to be eggs in under their cheeks on the underside. So we infer that to be females with these brood pouches, so carrying eggs with them um, under, their, under their cheeks. Yeah, it's pretty cool, yeah. Yes? Do you have any idea what that, these creatures live at? And also, do you ever, you sort of asked this before, but do you ever wonder why horseshoe crabs made it in trial by the sort of similar? Yeah, so, the, they lived, uh, they always lived on the shelf, continental shelf. So they always, like, they weren't um, deep ocean critters at all. Uh, some, some of the babies um, have been hypothesized to be pelagic. So that is that they would hatch out of the egg and then float really far away. Um, that's based on their morphologies and their global distributions, for example. Uh, some have been hypothesized to be much deeper water or much deeper on the shelf because they have these really big eyes that they um, need to collect as much light as possible. Um, but for the most part, they would have lived, yeah, just off, the, just off the beaches where there's still enough light and primary productivity for them to be scavenging. Um, and as to why they made it, oh, sorry, didn't make it and horseshoe crabs did, yeah, again, it's, that's, that's the big question. Like, I mean, maybe because there's, I think, two living horseshoe crab species only, like somehow just those two got lucky and, you know, because a, a lot of horseshoe crabs have gone extinct as well, you know, so, yeah. What were their sensory organs, predominantly? Um, so they had antennae. We have preserved antennae as well for them. Stick out of the head. Um, oh, there's an, yeah, this one here. Um, and they also have, also there's some um, groups that have these like pits, these little holes essentially in their exoskeleton. Uh, and they've been inferred to have um, been where like little hairs, sensory hairs would have poked through. They would have used those. Um, uh, and the gills possibly also had some sensory function to detect um, water flow and, and things like that. Uh, they also had eyes, um, Trino. So they had the first uh, or one of the first highly developed um, compound eyes as well. They had likely really good vision. Um, we don't know whether they could, they had any like chemosensory or olfactory, so smelling. Um, being able to sense like chemicals, we're not entirely sure of things like that. Yeah, so um, that specimen that I showed very early on that had the kind of line of trilobites in a row that had been preserved like that, it's been hypothesized that um, they have this big horn on their head as a kind of sensory structure as well that might have been, that would have been able to detect either changes in water flow or um, where their fellow members were um, so that they could follow, because those trilobites didn't have eyes, they were blind. So they might have used that structure as a navigation tool or something like that. Yeah. You mentioned um, a few times finding them in pyrite. Is there a relationship or finding them in pyrite? I'm not entirely sure. I think the pyritized trilobites are of a specific age and of a specific localities. Um, so it's really just the preservation style, what preservation mode is available, I think. I don't necessarily have, know that it has anything to do with their, or had anything to do with their biology. Yeah. Two more questions. Okay, <laughs> yep, sorry. Uh, How did you find your collecting site out west? Oh, yeah, that's uh, uh, a long, I didn't find it, I wish I did, but it's a kind of long known. That site, I think, was discovered but um, in terms of like for trilobites, oh, I think like even Charles Doolittle Walcott had been there. So, you know, well over a century ago, this site had been visited by 
paleontologist, so it's pretty, yeah. All, most of the um, Paleozoic rocks in Utah, um, well, fossiliferous exposures are pretty well um, understood from those early kind of um, geology surveying days. Yeah. Okay, last question. Um, you showed this graphic showing some of the largest coalesces in Umbrella. You said the largest in the moon was 720 uh, millimeters. And I think it was great, like, kind of to zoom out of the smallest. Mm -hmm. the dimensions of the smallest. Sorry? The, the dimensions of the smallest to the right. You said the largest was 700. Oh, that's a, good, that's a good point. I should put that in there for the next time. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. A millimeter, two millimeters? Like, oh, it's, it's like definitely less than a millimeter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like that kind of magnitude. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks again, everyone.